Matthew, welcome. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. You have a passion for Zambia. Mm -hmm. What attracts you to that country? Well, I grew up there, and you know, people will tell you that um, once you've lived in or if you grew up in Africa, it always draws you back. A lot of people say that. Um, but further than that, you know, New Zealand is very comfortable. It would be very nice to continue and, and just live here and enjoy what New Zealand has to offer. But I think w w my answer to that is, is that I can't turn my back on the needs I see. You know, that really is at the bottom of it. There are so many needs in Africa. And when, when you've lived there for many years and you're comfortable with the setup, uh, it, it's, I can't turn my back on that, no. no. And, and one of the specific needs, of course, is, is education. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit about your plans to help the Zambians with their education? Well, I need to step back in time here because my wife Alison and I went uh, to Africa uh, in 1987 and we went to teach in an in international school in Malawi and it was a fee-paying school and we were paid nice salaries and so forth. We were there for five years. We moved to Zimbabwe. We had an, a, a jobs there in Harare for a year and a half, again at private fee-paying schools, and then up to Zambia, God called us to Zambia to a mission school. And again, although it was a mission school, it was a school where those who got into it had to pay fees. And the minute you have that in Africa, you cut out 90% of Zambian kids, because 90% of Zambian kids are poor and can't afford those private, private school fees. So we began to think, well, there must be a better way of, of addressing some of the needs than just really touching the tip of the iceberg with those who can afford it. So we hung fire on this a little bit and then uh, I have a friend who's on the copper belt in Zambia and he used to say to me um, we could start a school uh, for poorer Zambians and we can pay for it by running a farm. So that was the start of the the whole idea of starting something separately from the government sector, separately from other missions and separately from the international schools. In other words, community schools for Zambians in poorer areas uh, and paid for not by the parents by paying fees but out of the profits from agriculture. That was the plan. And, and hence the, the Lima Paler Foundation, yes. Lima yeah. being cultivate, yes. Paler being give. Yes. Mm -hmm. How does that work in with the plans you have to set up a school there? It happened like this. We, we, uh, I started to look around for a farm. I thought, well, if, John, if what John says is, is right, then we need 50 hectares. We need to be near a, a, river, a, a water source. We need to have electricity. We'll grow bananas because that's, that I knew how to do because I'd started a banana pro project in the previous school. Now, we had a, a pupil in school at that time whose father knew. He was a farmer up in, on the other side of Kitwe, and he knew what we were planning to do and he came to me on the last day of, of school term and he said we could sell you 50 hectares, we've got 50 hectares we could sell you and it's already got a school on it. Now it turned out that his father had started this school, the Cedric School, back in the 1970s. He'd paid for it out of his own pocket all these years. Cedric is now getting old and the son says I'm not sure that I want to inherit this school because how am I going to afford to pay for this? I've got kids of my own to educate. So the, the whole Cedric project began then, I believe. We came home to New Zealand. We started to pray about it seriously. But we reached a point, too, where we realized that if we were to run this and make it really work, uh, we're, going to, um, we're going to have a lot of other people saying, hey, this is a good idea. Uh, let's do this as well. In other words, running a school from the profits from agriculture. Now, Zambia has a lot of potential in that because it's got a lot of land which is not, not being used. And it's not a new idea because a lot of community schools in Zambia are already doing that. They've got their little um, production units um, next to or attached to the school and they grow coffee or they grow cotton or they grow whatever. Um, the only problem is that they don't make enough money from their farming enterprises to really pay for the expenses of the school. So what we need to do is make sure it works properly and make sure that it, it, it earns good profits. So would you be exporting some of the farm produce or, or would it be to supply the local At market? the moment we, we see that there's, there's plenty of scope in the local market. Uh, one of the big problems with farming in Zambia is that small scale farmers, um, farmers who are working on a subsistence level, they don't have cash, they don't have capital. So they might have quite a bit of land but they can't, they can't develop it because you need capital to, to run a commercial farm. So we felt, well, one thing that we can do is we can introduce capital, and our friend John Enright was doing that. He wanted to help in poverty, with poverty in Zambia by helping the local farmers. 
So he would go to them and say, well, look, I can help you set up a banana plantation. I'll provide the, the capital cost, which is about $10,000 um, per hectare. And, um, and I'll help you get it in, but you must do the work. I'll look after all the marketing, because that's difficult. And we will split the profits 50-50 at the end. So that's a model that we felt we, we should try to follow. And yes, we need the funds, because to set up in farming and do that properly and, and, and farm on a, on a larger scale, you need, you need the, the capital. What's the target? It's over a million dollars, over three years, yeah. And how, how can Kiwis help if you're wanting to get them interested in this project? How can they help with the, with the funding? Well, you know, Alison and I have seen in our years in Africa that very often God supplies the funds from unexpected sources. And I'm not used to this fundraising game. You know, we went out as missionaries and God looks after our needs. And that's a, a, re, a real reward to your faith when you see that happening. But um, so the idea of coming back and raising this amount of money is quite foreign to me in a way. But it's been a, a learning curve and it's been interesting to see how it works. But to answer your question, yeah, how can people help? Well, we, we started the foundation because we realized that the Cedric project might only be the first of many. If this works, we can actually gravitate to other areas of need and, and try to get the whole concept going in other schools or other educational institutions. Um, so we thought, well, if we have a foundation to do that, the foundation can be the umbrella organization to look after Cedric and whatever else, else happens after Cedric. We have a website, uh, www.limapela.org, so they can give through that. They can go onto the website and give through that, or pledge donations through that, or they can send their checks to us to our address, which is also on the on the on the website. Matthew, thank you, and we wish you and your team all the very mm -hmm. best You're with welcome. your project. Thank in you Zambia. very much. Thank you, Anne. Thank you for the time.